perfection is not what you're aiming for. You're, you're aiming for a level of consistency that's yeah. acceptable. Mm -hmm. Consistency is the difference between someone who plays in the Eastern North and someone who plays in the Premier League. Yeah. You know, the adrenaline of making a really good save, yeah. uh, especially when there's, there's something on the line, as yeah. well. that's, that's when it's really good. Yeah. If you want to be amongst the best and you want to compete with bigger and better people, yeah. teams, then you have to put in, put in the hours, basically. Yeah. You, you have to accept that sometimes you're not always going to be perfect, but you've always got to give your best. Yeah. And I think with goalkeeping, more than half the time, it can be a psychological game yeah. as much as it is a skill to say. Yeah. Welcome back to another episode of Keeping It Out of the Net. This is episode five of season one, and yet again, I've got another really exciting guest today. Obviously, this series is all about interviewing the very best goalkeepers I know who have played to a very high level, currently in the game, or have been in the game, either coaching or playing. And today's guest has played for some very top clubs. Uh, he's played for the likes of Sudbury, Villariki, Barking, Great Wakering, and most notably, Dagenham Redbridge. He's also played for Concord Rangers, and most recently, Brentwood Town. I got to know him through being at the same school as him, Brentwood School. Uh, we also shared the same coach with Mal Downing, who was the first guest on this show. So I'm really excited to introduce my fifth guest, Ollie Bowles. Ollie, thanks for coming thanks on to the show. Thanks for having me. Great. So just for the purposes of the audience, uh, the young goalkeepers watching on this channel, yeah. just um, give us an idea of what got you into goalkeeping and then maybe some of the highlights of your sure. career. Um, so I mean, the, how I got into goalkeeping is probably how lots of people get into goalkeeping. I, I wanted to play upfield. Yeah. Uh, when I was very young, I used to play upfield. And then uh, I've got an older brother. Okay. He's six years older than me. Yeah. And he would just stick me in goal. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd smash balls at me. And eventually I kind of got used to trying to save yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. First dive down the way. <laughs> then you realise you start getting a bit competitive. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> You know, me and my brother were very competitive, yeah. so it became a thing, you know, I had to say. Yeah. And then you get better and better at it, um, and then I started trying to play for the school teams and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, you didn't mind diving around in the mud, you like, no, well, got stuck I think at first I probably didn't, yeah. but then you get, you get like a, a buzz, yeah. you get a buzz, that's, you know, the adrenaline of making a really good save, yeah. uh, especially when there's there's something on the line as yeah. well. That's that's when it's really good. Yeah. So I think that's what really got me into goalkeeping and how I effectively became a goalkeeper to start with. Yeah. And who was like who was your role model like growing up? Like was there a goalkeeper you watched on TV or was it maybe more close to home? Was it um, obviously I know you, your dad watches you a lot and yeah. close to him. Um, who was like your inspiration? Who like really uh, spurred you on like mm -hmm. in, the, in the more recent years? I think when I was younger, I. It, initially, it was just a, a competitive thing with my brother, but then obviously I, 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 I'm a Spurs fan, so I'd go and watch Spurs games when I was quite young, and uh, I think I, I used to enjoy watching. I mean, this is a long time ago. Neil yeah. Sullivan and Casey Keller. I mean, they weren't the best goalkeepers uh, in the Premier League at that time, but I, I, I used to love the kind of the highlight reel of like yeah, making yeah. that great save, yeah, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and that was something that kind of inspired me to keep going with it. And it was something that I kind of worked on in my own game. Because mm -hmm. I, love, I love making great saves. Everyone loves making yeah, great yeah. saves. Um, and I think that's, that's part of what inspired me at that time. Cool. Yeah. There's obviously a, a big part of goalkeeping is the saves, and that's obviously the, the glamour side of it yeah. and such. But um, obviously, we both worked with uh, Mel Downing, who's obviously a, yeah. a great coach, very old school, but oh, um, yeah. my original sort of mentor, coach as well. And the big thing he advocates is the basics, you know, like yeah. the basics, trying to catch the ball, Absolutely. first touch, things like that. What would you say, um, having worked with maybe some other coaches yeah. at Concord, Dagenham, Redbridge, what would you say is um, some of the biggest things, one or two of the biggest things you would say goalkeeping's about, apart from the big saves? I think communication's key. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just in goalkeeping, but in life in general. You've got to have good communication. Uh, and when you're working, when you're the goalkeeper, there's, there's a whole defence in front of you and they don't necessarily know what's going on behind yeah. them or around them. And you have to let them know 
and you have to organise them, and that's something, especially in non-league football, that becomes very, very clear. It starts from the back, like absolutely, absolutely. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, being a league is key, isn't it? Absolutely, and I think that's something that Mal probably started to instil in me when I first started working with him when I was fifteen, sixteen, yeah. and then obviously when I was at Dagenham and Redbridge, that's something that they would try and reinforce and it's something that I still get told every week now at yeah. Brentwood Town. So it is something that you have to be aware of and work on and uh, actively think about doing yeah. um, and trying to be as clear and concise as possible. 100%. Obviously, um, Dak and Redbridge, big club, obviously yeah. probably the highlight of your career. What was, um, you know, what was that like? And also, obviously when it came to an end, how did you deal with you know, being released, obviously eventually? Yeah. But what was it like to start with, like being around Dak and Redbridge? It was very exciting. I mean, I I went there on on a trial basis, um, I, I believe for a contact at Mounds. Okay. Um, and I played in a, in a what was an academy league game, uh, and I had a great game. Yeah. Um, pulled up quite a few good saves. I think we drew one all against Brentford, and uh, the the coach was like, okay, you yeah. know, we like him. He can he can keep coming along. Um, and it, it kind of snowballed from there. And uh, at the time, I was actually doing my A levels at Brentwood School, so it was it was a really unusual situation because I don't think the school had ever had someone do that A levels and yeah. do the football um, simultaneously. They had people do GCSE, yeah, yeah. So A levels, yeah, yeah. Not and being healthy, and <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, that took some some working out with with the school and and um, obviously with Dagenham. Um, but we were able to do it, and uh, it took a lot of time management for myself as well. Because, yeah. I mean, I don't know if, if people are aware how tricky A levels can be. Yeah. But you have to put a lot of lot of effort into yeah. them, and there's Especially a lot of work. decent grades. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I wanted I wanted good grades because yeah. realistically, you need that option. Even yeah. when you're at an academy, you yeah. know in the back of your head that maybe two, three of your yeah. team might be good enough. Yeah. So. You, you've got to, you, you've always got to be aware of your life outside of football as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's how it started for me at Dagenham. And then um, as the season progressed, I was working a lot with the first team, which was fantastic. I yeah. just absolutely loved that. Uh, so especially when I would train with the first team and they'd have training matches and yeah. stuff. Um, because for me, I, I could only win from that experience. You know, yeah. even. Even if I had a bad game or whatever, it was still it was it was time in the bank yeah. for me. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Um, so that was really exciting. I used to love that. Um, and then when my time at Dagenham came to an end, it was you know obviously it's it's not, never a very nice thing, no. but it's one of those things that you just you have to accept and you have to think well, you know where can I go from here? Do I want to keep doing this? Yeah. Um, and how can I how can I improve on this? So for me, I I know I still like playing football. Yeah. Maybe I I maybe I'd lost a little bit of how much I used to yeah, love it, yeah. but I I knew I still wanted to keep playing. So uh, I focused on trying to stay in the game, but perhaps at a lower level. Yeah. And something that I could balance with a job and uh, going to university. Yeah. So at that time, I was going to university and. It was actually for a contact of Ian Wignall from okay. the school. He knew Danny Cowley, who was the yeah. manager of Concord Rangers. Yeah. So I went over there, trained with them. They they'd just been promoted to the Conference South, so yeah. that you know it was a really good level. Uh, and basically, they wanted a, a younger keeper who could be on the bench yeah. and perhaps come in every now and again yeah. if they needed. And I, you know, at that time, that suited me to the to the ground really because I was able to balance it with going to university in London and yeah. being able to come back and, and play football. So that was that was really good. Uh, and that was a really good time. I really enjoyed that. Most of those players, it was their first time in the conference South as yeah. well. So they were finding their feet, but they were holding their own. Yeah, so yeah. it was, you know, and Danny Cowley obviously has gone on to yeah, yeah, bigger, and, yeah. bigger and better things, yeah. but uh, he was a fantastic coach to work with because you got to see how much care and detail mm. he, you know, really paid attention to detail. And I think that's, it was, it was a good lesson for me as a young player, not yeah. just as a goalkeeper, that you have to, if you want to be amongst the best and you want to compete with bigger and better 
people, yeah. teams, then you have to put in put in the hours basically. Yeah. Obviously, when you were at um, Concord, you say you spent most time on the bench. Yeah. Obviously, you were. I'm not sure who was the goalkeeper number one. Like about um, so, it was Butler. Okay. Um, a good keeper. Great keeper. Yeah. It, he's not the tallest keeper, but his distribution was unbelievable and a fantastic shot stopper. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I remember actually coming to a game. He was because um, Mal brought me along. He was very. His communication was. Yeah, was really yeah, good very well. good communication as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and. You know, he 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 played for quite a few non-league teams, and it, it, he gave me some good experience and and kind of showed me w what to expect in non-league. Yeah, you know I mean, he uh, he he definitely gave me some good tips. And and watching him play, his communication, his distribution was something that it became clear that those were very key concepts in non-league and um, the distribution levels in non-league they just yeah they've gone through the roof really because yeah. now i see players and all they do is sidewind and they they can hit the ball yeah 50p coin can't they but yeah maybe back then there was less of that and he yeah. was he was very very good at that and it yeah. was it was clear that was the direction that it was going yeah. Obviously, there's different paths you can take in football. Obviously, you can. Uh, I'm in a similar position this season at Tilbury. Uh, yeah. I played for 23s, but I'm on the bench for the first team. Yeah. Uh, there are a guy called Harry Gurley, who was Millwall. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, you can spend a season on the bench and learn from someone better than you, mm -hmm. which you did at Concord. Uh, but then, obviously, you do need that match experience. And I've looked at you and looked at your career. Obviously, at a young age, you were playing mm -hmm. for some decent level teams, obviously, like Sudbury, yeah. uh, Barking, Brentwood, and obviously, mm -hmm. you've been back to Brentwood. Uh, but how crucial was that at a young age to you know, get around uh, men's football? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, what, when I was at Concord, uh, obviously the, the first team manager, Danny Cowley, was keen to try and get me some experience mm -hmm. as well. So in my first season with them, at the end of the season, Brentwood, um, they needed the keeper on a short-term loan basis. Yeah. So I went out there and that's where I met Adam Flanagan, yeah. the, the Brentwood manager at the time. Uh, and it went okay, you know, I, I can't remember how we did, but it, it generally was okay. Yeah. Um, and then the next season, Brentwood needed a keeper for the whole season. Yeah. And uh, I went on loan to Brentwood, and, you know, that suited me, yeah. local club. Yeah. Um, and it went, you know, we weren't expected to do great on paper. I remember the league prediction said that we were meant to finish. 18th or something yeah. and it kind of inspired everyone yeah, yeah. Um, and we went out winning the playoffs so, yeah, yeah. so that was you know a big a big step in my non-league career it kind of gave me gave me a bit of a a brand almost yeah. you know people suddenly were like oh he was in that team yeah so that that's one of the things especially for a young keeper if you can get you know uh, the experience, and then if you can get any success on that experience, then it will it will give you a level, yeah. you know. And then from there, ironically, the team who we beat in the semi final of the playoffs, mm. Sudbury, I say, yeah, they were interested in me after that game. Um, so I I went there the next season because Brentwood changed manager, Adam went to Concord, yeah. So it's a lot of swapping going on, yeah. There. But um, that's how that happened. So I ended up at Sudbury. And no, I, I kind of rotated through a few clubs since then. Um, generally, the clubs have been successful, but my time there has been mixed. Mm. Um, I think when you're a young goalkeeper, that can happen. You're never always going to get perfect performances no. every yeah. week, uh, and it can it can be disheartening. And yeah. if you you know you know what you're capable of, but consistency is the difference between someone who plays in the Eastern North and someone who plays in the Premier League. Yeah. So. That that's in your head. You you have to accept that sometimes you're not always going to be perfect, but you've always got to give your best. You yeah. Know? And I think with goalkeeping, more than half the time it can be a psychological game as yeah. much as it is a skill. So, yeah. so whether that be injury or being oh, dropped or making yeah. a mistake, it's you just... know, every 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 week there's a new <laughs> yeah. psychological hurdle to yeah. deal with, isn't there? Probably well, higher position on the pitch. Exactly. So, yeah. There's all kinds of dimensions to it that would never affect an outfield player. You know, you've got potentially, I don't know, 50, 100 people behind your goal, yeah. hoping you'll concede <laughs> and telling you, you know, you're this and that. Yeah. And then you've got you've got to try and retain the confidence of your manager. You don't have, you know, you have to retain the confidence of your back four. Um, 
because if you start to lose a relationship with them, then yeah. all kinds of problems can happen. Yeah. So it can be very difficult to manage that kind of stuff. And certainly, if you, you, you can quite easily lose grasp of what you're there to do, which is mm. to kick the ball out of the net. Yeah. You can start worrying about all kinds of problems. So very psychological position and something that many people probably would never even think about. Definitely. Um, but it's key. How do you uh, sort of balance, obviously, if you're a professional footballer, it's yeah. all you do, and obviously you can afford to do it, especially if you're being paid by, but obviously, it's not, it's, you know, non-league level, it's still very tough and very physical, in some ways more mm. physical than sometimes the higher leagues, mm. but you've still got to balance it with your job, your career, or university, you know, back in the day yeah. as well, and also still get better as a goalkeeper, because obviously you can go to club training, maybe not get a lot of goalkeeping stuff. Yeah. So how do you ensure that you're still getting better and also balance, you know, other things as well whilst still trying to get better? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, you know, in my experience, I've always tried to to keep myself focused on a, on a goal, mm. um, especially when I join a team. I, I would think, what's the goal for this team? What yeah. are we aiming for? Um, and how, how can I apply myself to achieve that goal? And then also in your, you know, in your day-to-day life, whether that be as a student or at work, you, yeah. you've got to think, you know, what, what am I aiming for here? Is it, am I trying to get a degree? Am I trying to get a certain grade? Am I yeah. trying to get a promotion? Um, and then you've got to know how much time, how much energy, how much effort do I have to put into this? Yeah to achieve what I'm looking for. And if I can't guarantee that I can do that, is there any other solutions I can use to my advantage to make this work? And then you've got to balance the two, mm. um, which which can be difficult. I mean, it's something which I have been doing since I was at school, because yeah. I've been balancing the football and the school yeah. simultaneously. Um, and then, continuously throughout university and now I still, you know, I, I own my own business and I still yeah. have to balance that with football. Um, and the, the only real way to do it is through careful time management and, and making sure that you know that you can apply yourself because when you can't apply yourself, that's that's when you'll be disappointed yeah. and disheartened. Yeah. You know? And what about right now? I mean, obviously um, years ago, I think when we all grow up, we, our goal is to, you know, be England goalkeeper, oh, maybe yeah. like, you know, go to the very top. <laughs> and obviously as we get older, yeah. you start to realise how tough it is and how tough it is to be at the very top level. But yeah. what is your goal now? Is it to just enjoy your football? Is it to maybe go a little bit higher? Sure. Is it still to maybe get into the professional ranks, get into the football league? What, what is it right now? At the moment, I would just say to, to enjoy my football. I had, after I would play for Barking, I'd, I'd stop playing for a little while because mm. I, I just wasn't enjoying it. I was, I was at law school. And that was taking up a lot of time and energy. Um, And I wasn't playing particularly well at football. I kind of lost some interest. I didn't, you know, it it just kind of leveled out. And I was was at a time where I was, I I just rather play with my mates. Yes, basically Sunday league football. Play outfield, playing goal. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Just for a laugh. but that sort of thing can bring you back to what it's all exactly. about. Exactly, like, I think that is somewhat what happened. Yeah, you know, I was playing with my mates, and they they play in a, a league where they play against other um, old schools. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, I got into that. I was playing mainly in centre midfield, which was quite funny, I guess, because it's completely different. Yeah. Um, but it, it was refreshing, and it was. It was um, it was a new kind of challenge, and it kind of re re energised me, refocused me a bit, kind of gave me a sense of you know this is fun. I do this because I enjoy doing this, and it's not it's not just a job. It's it's something that can can give you happiness mm. and fulfilment. So um, that brought me back into it a bit, and then at the time, Adam Flanagan had gone back to Brentwood. Yeah, he phoned me up and he said, you know, do you, do you want to come back and yeah. you know might just be training we'll see how we go kind of thing and I got back into it and with the right training and everything you know I was ready to go again yeah. so for me currently it's just about enjoying it trying to do the best I can do mm. you know um, 
you've got to be realistic. I don't think you're going to be a good goalkeeper anytime soon. Um, but you, you've got to try and play to the best level that you yeah. can. Striving for the best exactly. you can be, yeah. You've got to try and be the best you can be in everything, not just in goalkeeping. In terms of the, um, obviously we talked a lot about the mental side of things, but in terms of the physical attributes and stuff, I saw a, a post on Instagram the week and it said something like, hmm. always ask yourself a question, like how often do I face that kind of ball in training yeah. like, by just experiencing a game? Like, sure. Because I have made a mistake the other week and yeah. I was like, when have I actually done that in training? And I thought, I haven't. So mm-hmm. no wonder why I made a mistake. Uh, it was like a, a simple pick up, a, a bobbly yeah, ball. Yeah. And it could be a cross, it could be a, a top corner save. And obviously, like I said, it's not always about the top corner saves no. and the basics are key, you always do them. Yeah. But, um, you know, whether it's crossing, obviously crossing's a big thing, that's something that makes you stand out as a, a top goalkeeper or an average goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. But something like crossing, you know, what is your thought process coming out for the ball, you know, because obviously, instinctively, it's, it can be easy to hold back, it can mm-hmm. be easy to worry about, you're gonna drop the ball, make a mistake. What's your thought process on getting better at crosses, you know, in terms of training and yeah. your sort of technique? Is it just, you know, um, you know, just I, I, I'm coming for everything, yeah. or I'm only coming for things I think I can get, things like that? It's really interesting the way you phrased that, because I was thinking when you, when you were saying the question, you know, often the things that happen in a game mm. are very, very hard to replicate in training. Yeah. And you will never do a drill that will quite replicate the pressure that you will face in that scenario yeah. in the game. Even if there is, you know, a man and his yeah. dog in the crowd, yeah. it's it, very difficult to recreate. Uh, and you'll often find the mistakes that you make in games are ones that you you, you can't necessarily practice no. very easily. Um, and there will be saves that you. If you did do them in training, you would think absolutely nothing about it. Yeah, yeah. Just pick the ball up, and then, yeah. yeah. So, for me, I, I've worked with a lot of different types of coaches, and often, especially with older school coaches, they believe in doing the same thing yeah. every week, every week, and reinforcing, and to a level that's great. Yeah. But then, I also think you've got to be ready to expect the unexpected, especially yeah. when it comes to playing in a real match. You have to be prepared for the time when the guy doesn't give you the mid height yes. <laughs> or he, you know, he. It's not just a one bounce pick up. It, it bobbles across yeah. a dodgy field. Yeah. You know? it's, so it's being versatile. It's being versatile, and sometimes <laughs> dodgy service in training can be a good thing. Yeah. At times you've got to make the most out of everything. So I know it's fantastic when you go to training and everyone's zipping the ball and it's perfect. Yeah. But even the ones where it comes off someone's foot a bit dodgy, those are the ones yeah. that you should respect even more. Yeah, yeah. Because those are the ones that happen in the game. And if you don't save it, it'll be your fault. Mm-hmm. So that's that's my thought process on that. Is some, for me often variety keeps keeps me thinking. Yeah. Which is good. Um, in terms of crosses, my my personal opinion is I, I try and avoid putting myself in situations where I can make a mistake that is avoidable. Mm. So I will generally try and stay on my line. Yeah. That's not to say I haven't come for crosses and messed up because yeah. everyone has. Yeah. But it, you try and keep it as conservative and safe as possible unless you, you know that you will get there or that kind of the, the situation, you have to come for it almost. Mm. Um, that's, that's my strategy on that generally. Um, but obviously different types of crosses can cause different types of problems and different types of opponents as yeah. well. So these are all factors that are going on this, that, that will affect my judgment on whether I know I will catch that cross. You know, is it, is it a wet day? Is it muddy pitch? Is that, am I used to catching that type of football mm. even? Yeah, you know, am I, am I, are my gloves clean? Uh, yeah. you know, has the ball come out the sky very high? Is it flat? Is it is it very windy? Mm. Because these are very important things, especially wind. Yeah, you know, very important in judging across. So for me, try and I try and start very defensively. I start kind of behind center of the goal. Yeah, you understand. So just behind the penalty spot. Yeah, most yeah. That, if we're talking in the center. Mm. Um, because then that way it's always quicker to go forwards yeah. than it is to go backwards. Yeah. 
And then um, I'll wait, I'll judge the flight because if you go too quickly and you get put under it, mm. there's every chance that it will go over you mm. or you'll catch it too high and yeah. you'll be You're dropping down. it yeah. backwards. Or if someone catches you, you drop it that way. Yeah. So always, in my that's my strategy is to start a little bit deeper, take my time, think about it, consider all those factors going on, which is a lot. Yeah. And then if I know that I can catch it, I will try and catch it. If I don't know that I can catch it, but I know I have to do something about it, you've got to try and get something on it, even yeah. if it is a punch or. Yeah. You know, worst case scenario, I kind of flap a bit away because I'm trying to get yeah. away from that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, what about um, things like catching the ball? I mean, I've, I've watched him like a big brother of the one was Adrian West Ham guy. Yeah. Know? But I noticed about him, he always tends to parry things a lot. Yeah. And that's just his style of your Spanish keeper. But what would you say? Do you try to catch it at all times if possible, or do you sort of um, like what's your thought process before? Like, if it's a cross, would you mm -hmm. say? Do you decide for the match like it's too wet? I'm always just trying to punch it, or yeah. you know, there's a shot. I'm just going to try and parry it, or do you try and catch it as much as possible? I think, funny enough, it's something that I started thinking about this season more mm. than anything else. When when we work in training, we're always working for perfect perfection. Really, we're trying to you know try and make that perfect W catch, even if it's out the top corner. We're yeah. trying to catch yeah. it. When you know some coaches I worked with recently, Andy Young and, and then more recently Mark, Mark Edwards at Brentwood, mm. they've both been of the opinion you know you don't you don't have to try and make the perfect save because if you mess up, it will be a tap in for someone yeah. often. But if you do that save and you palm it wide of the post, everyone's just going to say that was a good save. Yeah. So you have to weigh that up when you're making this. Well, before you've made the save, even when you know he's about to pull the trigger, you're going to know how he's approaching it, where roughly where you think it's going and that kind of stuff. And then in your head you're making a decision, you're thinking, what's the chances of me catching this? Yeah. Can I hold this? If I can't hold this, I need to make sure that I'm palming it away from anyone coming in. Yeah. Not, so, get, to, not get caught in two minds. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. So for me, that kind of decision making is often made literally as they pull the trigger. Mm. Um, I don't think I would... I, I will try to avoid actively making a decision about palming it away before, like before I've even gone out on the pitch, because that would be, I don't know, that that would be quite limiting yeah. to like how I. You're um, responsive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I like to I like to be responsive to it, the scenario rather than narrow-minded. Is that yeah yeah? And uh, obviously you talked about distribution. Obviously kicking is uh in this league especially, but obviously you go higher. It's almost a given. You kind yeah. of have to be good at it. Um, what would you say is your approach to kicking? I've seen golf, you know, I think Rob Green was my earliest memory. He had like a system where they do like three steps back and two steps to the left. Yeah. Uh, what's your approach to goal kicks in terms of like, you know, do you set time aside outside of training? So obviously with club mm -hmm. training, you don't necessarily do, you know, a set routine of kicks, sure. you just get it through the game. So yeah. how do you actually get better at it? Um... It's a, it's a difficult one, really. Uh, it's something that I've always tried to get better at. It's mm. something that, you know, I, I'm I'm perfectly okay at, but mm. it's something that could be improved. Yeah. So, um, for me, I try and do a technique where if I have the time and it's like a just a normal goal kick off the floor, I will yeah. try and step back five times and then one step uh, across to my right, and generally that will, that will give me what I need. To get the run up, and I try yeah. and attack it with pace. Yeah. Because if I don't attack it with pace, I generally fall off the ball, yeah. and that's when I kind of curl it. Yeah. So that's what we want to try and avoid, especially when it's windy. Because yeah. I'm going to lose 10, 15, 20 yards potentially. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit like you know people who play golf. I I play golf, and it's something that I think about is if you if you don't. <laughs> If you kind of hook the ball, you yeah, slice yeah. the ball, you're always going to lose distance, especially yeah. if it's windy. So that, that's how you have to apply it to the kicking. Um, and, you know, the other day I was, I was watching Spurs v Liverpool and I saw how this thing kicked this ball. And he kicked it, it's so unusual to me, he kicked it kind of open 30th, but he kicked it so flat and it was yeah. driven and it must have gone 70, 80 yards. Yeah. And it was just like, how? Yeah. You know? The other one's Aaron Rams. Aaron Rams yeah. 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 Um, really good but he's, he's, he's fantastic, fantastic. but he's very good at the sideline yeah. technique which yeah. is another thing you know it's, 
it's just a case of, of practicing and, and doing what you feel comfortable doing because you don't want to overdo these things, you'll just injure yourself. Yeah. So, you know, I think lots of keepers will be injured themselves trying yeah. to kick a ball. Because people underestimate how much strength it requires um, and how much technique it requires. Yeah. If you have too much of one, it's, it doesn't go yeah. well. But if, yeah. Exactly. You know, I hurt my groin and my thigh and stuff trying to kick a ball because you know you, you, you want to hit it into the other half realistically. Yeah. Yeah. But to do that every time can be difficult yeah. when, it, when it's windy, when it's wet, all those kind of things. So it's about... It's about repetition, but being sensible with yeah. it. And I think it's about having, having fun with it as mm. well. You know, I think the more, the more you do goalkeeping, especially when you train more and more, you, you do a lot of service to other goalkeepers. Yeah. And it, it's sim simple, really, when you think about it. It's just volleying the ball, half volleying the ball. Yeah. But those kind of things, they, they build you up. They build up your ability to focus on the ball. Yeah, yeah and to um to get timing in your connection and your technique and then you can start to apply that to stuff like sidewinders yeah realistically once you know that you're comfortable kicking the ball 10 yards you can probably kick it 15 yards you can probably yeah, kick it 20 yeah. yards and yeah. then you know can't do that with this technique yeah. now <laughs> and then you build up and you build up and then then it's a case of just repetition and making sure that you can do it and then doing it not just on a nice sunny day in pre-season, yeah, yeah. doing it on a wet day in January, yeah. is that, is that, you know. Yeah. So, it's a case of some things you just have to try and do and make sure that you feel comfortable doing it. Because if you don't feel comfortable doing it, then you're already kind of at a disadvantage. You know, everyone's done that thing when they go to kick a ball and yeah. they think in the back of their head, oh, I'm not sure how to kick this very yeah. well. And then you don't kick it very well. Yeah. Um, like I said with golf, similar yeah. thing, you're standing over the golf ball and you think, mm, I'm not sure about this swing, and then yeah. you hit, hit a bad golf shot. Yeah. So um, it's about making sure that you're having fun with it and that you're very relaxed in your own head. Mm. And that's when you'll, you'll have results, basically. And what about, um, I mean, something Mal always used to tell me in terms of diving to your left or right, he said you wouldn't have a weak side. And yeah. I kind of thought that the same with kicking. I remember. I was on a course once with um, Chris Sutton, next professional. He yeah. said to me, because uh, it was like an open trial, he said, Well, can you kick on your left? Yeah. And at the time, I thought I'd never kick to my left. Yeah, I don't. But I remember a bit at a West Ham game once, and I saw, I think it was, I think it was Fabianski, and yeah. he just did a clearance, and he's, he's not left footed, I don't think, yeah. but he just did a clearance. I kind of thought, it just shows you if you want to be one of the best, that even something like working on your left yeah. foot is something you want to do. Is that, is that something you sometimes do? or? Think little things like that, especially like five months. Yeah, so I mean, a weak side, but certainly in terms of, of just the the simple stuff, I will I will try and work on my, my weaker side. Mm. Um, in terms of goalkeeping, I've never really thought about having a weaker diving side. No, um, I, I know some keepers do, but it's something I've I've never really thought about because I think it's quite a dangerous thought process yeah. to get into. You yeah. start thinking. Well, if he hits the penalty to my left, I'll yeah. probably say if he hits it to my right, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, that's a dangerous thought process to get into. Mm. That's not something I personally have ever dealt with. But in terms of using my feet, definitely, um, I've always been left footed. Yeah. Very heavily left footed. Uh, I can use my right foot. I don't mm. like using my right foot. I don't particularly train long distance kicking with my right foot because it's very unusual. But yeah, of course, yeah. But there are scenarios in the game where I'll get a dodgy back pass and oh, I'll have to try and boot the ball yeah. with my right foot. And yes, that is something that can, you can work on in training, but you have to also forsake some pride yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, because course. realistically, you're meant, you, you can never expect to kick it as well yeah. as you can with your other foot unless you're at Edison. Yeah. So, um, you have to kind of accept that, especially when you're training these kind of things, perfection is not what you're aiming for. You're, you're aiming for a level of consistency that's yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Um, and then once you have that, that's when you can start thinking about perfection. Mm. Um, and yeah, for me in training, we do a lot of passing and a lot of control with both mm. feet. Um, but in terms of long distance kicking, we don't do that much of that without our weaker foot because mm. it's not, it's not something that people generally no. try and attempt, no, yeah. um, especially in training, because 
when you when you're playing on league football, particularly, you, you, your time working with goalkeeper coaches is quite limited. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You generally, train two times a week, mm. so you might train for two hours. And realistically, you want to spend that time. The most important thing. The most important yeah. thing with your hands. But ironically, in a game, you might be involved in the game for I don't know two minutes of yeah. the ninety minutes, and yeah. half of that might just be kicking. Yeah. So it's. It's so important, and it's certainly becoming a bigger and bigger factor in the game at the moment. Yeah, it was, as you said, with Allison, Edison, yeah. Ramsdale, they can all kick the ball. And even in, in I mean, the they're role, good role models, aren't they? To, oh, yeah. to model on, really. Absolutely. Even in in the, you know the Isthmian North, the league we're in, it's um, the standard of kicking has gone up tremendously. Yeah. Um, if I can remember when I first played in the league, that I, I was not as good a kicker as I am yeah. now. And I, I don't, you know, lots of the keepers were, were not fantastic keepers. No, yeah. You know, they could all kick the ball, but yeah. the, the techniques were almost more old school yeah, back yeah. then. And now people can do unbelievable things, even mm. in, in the Isthmian North. Yeah. So, despite the fact, obviously, some teams play from the back, and obviously, yeah. they play from the box now yeah. and stuff, but this league in particular tends to just go along, doesn't it? Yeah, but, I think, you know on the Isthmian North, I think when I first played it was a mixture of older players from higher levels who come down yeah. and younger players who might be going up. Mm. And now there's a lot of players who are probably in and around their best years yeah. playing. So I think that says a lot about the standard of the league uh, and all the leagues in general because it obviously has a knock-on effect on higher up the pyramid as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's pretty impressive but it's also pretty pretty scary at the same time. Yeah. That's that's the level, and you and you have to keep improving. Otherwise, definitely, you know, that's how it goes. Last couple of questions. Um, yeah. What is something you do outside of goalkeeper that you do deliberately? Whether it's you know training in the gym or your diet and nutrition, or um, you like to do certain things to relax and unwind. Mm-hmm. What are things that really help you on outside of football, off the pitch, that help you directly in goalkeeping? Um, I like to uh, walk my dogs. I mm-hmm. think that's quite quite a good way to get away from it because mm. I can, you know, I can walk along, I can, if I want to think about football, I can think about football, mm. but at the same time, I can, I can just try and just focus on walking the dogs, yeah. you know what I mean? It's quite a relaxed thing and... But it's necessary. You know, it's like, necessary. It's kind of, yeah. The stress of it. Exactly. Yeah. It can be quite stressful, especially if you know that you made a mistake mm. because people can tell you made a mistake, but you know when you made a mistake. Yeah. Um, and even when people tell you you have a good game, mm. you will know, oh, I could have done that better. And, you know, I, I hit seven good goal kicks, but that one that went out for a throw in wasn't that good. Yeah. So it can, it can be a very, very difficult position to, mm. to balance your successes and your not successes. Yeah. I won't call them failures, but, yeah. you know, the times when things didn't go out, you want them to go yeah so don't want to get too high or too high exactly yeah. you've, got, you, you've got to try and be a very balanced individual yeah you know, psychologically you have to be very strong because there's <laughs> there's people behind your goal who will want to crush you as well yeah. so yeah um if you if you're fragile in that way then you'll be down very quickly <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah that's you know away from football i like to walk my dogs um and play golf. Something. I like to yeah. play golf. I find that's very, you know, it's a, it's a good way for me to channel kind of competitive nature, but also have fun with my yeah. friends. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just doing this for fun. If yeah. I have a bad day, what does it matter? Yeah. I can come back another weekend and yeah. I might have a totally opposite result. Yeah. And with the football, sometimes you can get lost in the, you know, Oh, my reputation's on the line here, and yeah. uh, you know this is this is also a job. I need to I need to attain the same kind of standards that people expect of me every week. Yeah. You know, you can really get lost in it all, which which can be difficult. You you've just got to remember at the end of the day, it's fun. You enjoy doing yeah. this. You do this because you enjoy it, mm. and you do it because you you want to try and improve not just as a goalkeeper or as a player, but you want to improve as a person. So you've got to look at things that you can do that can help you in all attributes of your life. That's just saying before. Obviously, um, you know, being a, we can be a bit of a Schmeichel, Peter Schmeichel, someone to be angry at players, but obviously yeah. being calm and 
collecting as well is equally important. Yeah. Uh, what's your approach? You tend to like, obviously where you have to, you have to get mm. your players back and tell them if they've done something wrong. Yeah. But generally, would you say that like, you don't like to be too aggressive with players or if, if it has to, you do? But you yeah, know, what's think, your sort of stance on that? Yeah, generally my approach in life is, is quite laid back. Mm. I think I can be quite, quite a laid back person, quite, quite relaxed about most things. Um, I know some goalkeepers will go absolutely ballistic, but generally, I think from my own experiences, people know when they've made a mistake. Yeah, they shouldn't need me to tell them um, because we're all in the same team. We, you know, we we should all be similar level players if we're all in the same team. So we should all be aware of what what is good and what yeah. is not. So I will tell them when when it's necessary. But generally speaking. I'll, I'll let them concentrate on their own game mm. because there's no need for me to go, to, you know, that was terrible or whatever. Yeah. If it's going to mess with the guy's head and we've yeah. still got another 45 minutes of football to yeah. play. So that's my approach to that. I know when I've made a mistake and I expect other players know when they made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, final question. If you were to go back, you know, 10 years or so, or even more, and you were to start your career again, you were talking to someone who's a young goalkeeper now who yeah. wants to make it all the way to the top or at least be professional or maybe just be a top semi-professional. Yeah. If you had to say one thing um, that's the most important that you've learned if you were starting again, what would that piece of advice be as a goalkeeper? I think it would be to make sure that you communicate. Mm. I think that's so, so key. You know, not just on the pitch, but to make sure that you're present in the dressing room. Um, these are all factors. It, it, you know, sometimes managers will pay more attention to that kind of stuff because in in a match yeah. you're only in the match for a couple of minutes. Yeah. You know, but they want to know that you're still there. Yeah. Because it's, you can avoid it's reassurance. You can avoid that as much as yeah. anything else. That you are paying attention and that mm. you are trying to help your defence. Yeah. Even when you're not fully involved in it, and then also in the dressing room, it's reassurance that. You know, you care about the team. Yeah. You are there because you're you're a good character. Yeah. You know? And you, often, when you're around professional football teams or even good semi-professional teams, there'll be players in the team who might not necessarily be the best footballer, mm. but they'll have a good character. Yeah. And the right attitude. Exactly. Yeah. The right attitude, um, and that can take you a very long way. Yeah. So. That would be my, my approach to that, is communication and making sure that you always come with the right attitude. Yeah. That's great. That's really good. And uh, another great episode, and I hope you did enjoy that. Um, Ollie's been really good help to me, and I'm sure you can take lots away from that. So if you did enjoy this video, give it a like, click subscribe, and obviously stay tuned for episode six, which will be coming very soon. But Ollie, thanks for doing it. Thank you, mate. Thanks, Ollie. Cheers. Cheers.